We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. So the universities have to demonstrate that they've got good student outcomes, which used to include things like a good career, but now includes, you know, keeping them from becoming terrorists and stuff. Lock your doors, close the blinds, change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Catherine McGlynn and Sean McDade, and we discuss their book and research on radicalization and counter-radicalization in higher education. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for £3 a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Catherine and Sean, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us. Thanks very much, Chris. No problem. Thank you. Well, for the benefit of listeners, please can you both tell us a little bit about yourself? We'll start with Catherine and then go to Sean. So Sean and I are both lecturers at the University of Huddersfield and uh, I came there via um, a PhD about uh, paramilitary politics in Northern Ireland, worked for a brief bit in Central Asia, Yeah. started as a researcher and then moved on to uh, Huddersfield from 2007. And uh, I ended up at Huddersfield the uh, best part of 10 years ago uh, after a stint as a, an historian, yep. PhD in history from Queen's Belfast. And then I worked on the Hillsborough Independent Panel yeah. Inquiry at the School of Law in Queen's as well. So then, then to Huddersfield and the rest is history. Excellent. So what has it led to you both wanting to research the subject of radicalization and counter radicalization in higher education? So we've had a long-standing interest in uh, research in terrorism and political violence, which started for both of us with a focus on Northern Ireland. Yeah, We teach a terrorism module and the actual project started out as something different. It started out as an interest in generally there are certain topics that students find very controversial and lecturers find very controversial. Terrorism contains a lot of them. Let's do a project about um, how to improve communication. And then just the Counterterrorism and Security Act kind of happened at the same time. And we were already interested in radicalization. We thought this is a, a wonderful opportunity to bring these two together. There's so much debate about what this act is going to do. Let's actually find out how it is impacting upon people and what their experiences are. Fantastic. In 2015, as part of the UK government's Counterterrorism and Security Act, which is known as the CTSA, a legal duty was created to institutions such as universities had to have a due regard to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. Now, on the surface, this sounds like a logical idea, but in practice, it's sort of far more complicated. So can you give us an overview of what this sort of prevent duty is? Yeah, the prevent duty comes out in the context of uh, the conflict in Syria, wouldn't you say, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. The backdrop to this is the declaration of the caliphate by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi at Mosul. This and the subsequent, if you like, issue with people going 
to Syria um, as part of their perceived obligations in that regard uh, was a huge, if you like, concern for policymakers. And the question of radicalization had already been hardwired into UK security policy. Mm. And the Counterterrorism Security Act then introduces this prevent duty. A range of public institutions had to have due regard to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. And that covered higher education, it covered further education, statutory education, and uh, institutions like the NHS. So the responsibility, if you like, for keeping an eye potentially on people who might be drawn into violence became much wider legally than it had been for some time and kind of institutionalized. That necessitated organizations like universities then to have a policy and to have an audit trail to show that they were engaging with and complying with the prevent duty. Yeah. What kind of volume of people were sort of going out to join groups like ISIS? Well, there was a report by Richard Barrett in 2017, and the estimate in that report, if memory serves, was that there were about 800 people from the UK who had gone to Syria, about half of which had had come back at the time of writing of the report. Now, of course, not all of those may have been people who fought, Mm. and of course, that's the nature of, of those kinds of, of places. We don't know what everybody was doing there. Uh, some people might have been involved in entirely legal activities. Uh, but the estimate, as far as I recall from that report by Barrett, was that there was approximately 800 people from the UK, about half of which had come back. Yeah, OK. So in government policy, radicalization is essentially seen as a pathway to violence extremism. To complicate matters, there are two opposing views of the roots of radicalization. One as the product of alienating circumstances and the other as a result of exposure to ideologies deemed extremist. Can you talk to us about the concept of radicalization, how it informs counterterrorism policy and the debates around linking radicalization to violent extremism? OK, we've always talked generally in, in the idea of radicals and radicalization, mm. but the concept as we're talking about it now is really a kind of product of a uh, the sort of post 9-11 world mm. and uh, really develops in Europe as well a few years after with uh, attacks taking place in Madrid and London as, as a key way of saying this is what causes terrorism and so therefore countering it would counter terrorism. Mm. And regardless of what approach you take, at heart is the idea that lots of people will be attracted to ideas. These ideas may not necessarily be extreme. People who get attracted into extremist circles around those ideas may not necessarily be violent. And then as you keep moving further along the path, the likelihood of engaging in violence increases. So if you were to catch people at an early step along this pathway and pathways, funnels, staircases, these are the common metaphors that come up. Mm. If you caught people early, then the benefits would not just be for victims who are never victims, but for these people themselves, their lives would be much better. Mm. And as you say, there's these two versions, uh, a means-based version that uh, poverty, alienation, racism, these are the kind of things that will drive people, push factors. And then a values-based explanation that there are certain ideological swirls around communities that are likely to create uh, values that may uh, make vul- people vulnerable to extremism. The big focus was Islam and Islamism. Over time, increasingly, the focus has incorporated the far right. Mm. In your book, you state that counter radicalization may not be successful and that it may actually be counterproductive, and that there appears to be a gap between the sort of nuance and caveats of academic research into the subject. And it leads to a kind of a simplified and very confident approach from policymakers. So can you, can you talk to us sort of about this? Yeah, so the developing body of literature around radicalization, as I said, often relies on these metaphors. And they're very eye-catching and attractive to policymakers. Because if there is step one to 10 and up to step one to four, you can ensure that someone completely doesn't get involved in criminal activity. They're in a pre-criminal space. That sounds great. But when you actually look at researchers and what they're talking about, they had a lot more complexity to them. One example is I I spoke about the metaphor of the staircase. Mogadam talks about staircase to terrorism. But he makes it clear that one of the kind of radicalizing factors are 
bigger macro factors, such as the West's involvement in a number of countries which just suppressed democratic movements, allowed Islamism to flourish and created alienation. Hmm. Now, this isn't a way of um, getting into some sort of moral relativism because some governments conduct poor foreign policy. Therefore, all its citizens deserve to be victims of terrorism. It's saying that there are lots and lots of factors that have created the situation that we are in now. If you strip everything down to this individual who is liable to be drawn and and in the metaphors that are often used, groomed towards terrorism, all those nuances and complexities uh, go away. Mm. It doesn't take into account the fact that nobody is yet to actually discover and establish a set of case studies that demonstrate this uh, direct pathway to terrorism. Hmm. It could be counterproductive. People have argued that it's alienating, particularly its focus on Muslims, creating them as a suspect community. And it reflects a general criticism of a lot of modern counterterrorism, that they ignore older things that were learned during previous terrorist campaigns, saying everything is new and brand new and we need this brand new solution. And particularly in the UK context, the argument of, well, there's been a long standing conflict here involving Northern Ireland, uh, and we don't seem to have learnt lessons there to apply to this now. And indeed, everything we're talking about today, radicalisation, the prevent duty, does not actually apply to Northern Ireland. And is there a reason to why it doesn't apply to Northern Ireland, do we think? Yeah, there's um, an acceptance for the British government that this is not about the stories that we tell about why people get involved in Islamist and uh, far-right activity. They accept historical roots. Uh, For example, the Conservatives have generally been very values-based in their approach to radicalisation, but they've long accepted means-based explanations for conflict in Northern Ireland, that uh, the violence takes place particularly uh, in areas of social deprivation. But also, it's about uh, what the lot of the promotion and the cure for radicalisation is. Uh, One of it is the promotion of fundamental British values. And uh, if you want to uh, rock up to a nationalist area in Northern Ireland and start promoting fundamental British values, well, have the time of your life, my friend. Uh, (laughs) But I think everybody would agree that it might be a little bit of a non-starter as a policy. Mm. But it is largely because the focus was so strongly on Islamism as well, that everything kind of fell away. It took a long time before uh, far-right ideology was uh, acknowledged, although it has to be stressed, is now seen as central to the strategy and the project. Yeah, I think uh, it's important to note that in the context of Great Britain, Islamist and far-right ideologies are very much fringe phenomena. Mm. Whereas in Northern Ireland, uh, it mightn't be all that fringe to hold nationalist, very fervently nationalist or very fervently unionist views. Um, and I think we're, we're, we're into questions of number here, numbers here. It just would be impractical and I would say impossible and highly likely to cause a great deal of contention if you try and roll out the prevent strategy in Northern Ireland. I think you would have a summer that would be much more fraught than summers usually are in Northern Ireland for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> yeah. And um, just quickly, it, it, obviously the Prevent um, programme sort of started with New Labour and it went through to the coalition government and it's been through, am I right in counting, two Conservative governments since the coalition? I've lost track now, but yeah. Has it changed much over those sort of periods? Yes, it, it definitely has. Um, the first incarnation included a much greater acceptance of socioeconomic factors. Uh, and over time, it's moved much more strongly to the values base. The first projects had a lot of money thrown at them, not necessarily brilliantly audited. And when uh, the Conservative and Coalition government with the Lib Dems started looking into it, they were sort of saying, where is this money going? It's all very nice to spend money on projects such as bringing a Muslim team and a white team together to play football in Oldham. Is this counter radicalization? There's also actually concern that um, extremists under the guise of counter-radicalisation, had actually snaffled a lot of the money for themselves. Mm. So there was an attempt to cut that off, to separate entirely from projects of community cohesion. Over time, there's been more acceptance of the need to focus on the far right, although they're still seen as in symbiosis of is- with Islamism. Uh, prevents a referral service channel has seen increasing numbers of right-wing cases. So, yeah, there has been some change over time. And I think another change has been a move away from devolving and decentralizing it and trying to evolve local communities. And it's become a lot more 
top down, a lot more checklist and a lot more safeguarding and procedures. Whereas before it was about capacity, education and an emphasis on communities that I think has uh, slightly shifted as the project's gone on. If I'm right in remembering from a conversation I've had with people from Prevent, and I could be misremembering or, or not quite getting it right, but um, there is a slight issue with the kind of expecting a community to deal with radicalization within their own community. Um, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts on, on that. Well, to my mind, that, that's exactly what the Prevent Duty does. The Prevent Duty actually tries to push the responsibility for dealing with extremism to the entire community mm. and to, as it were, socialize that responsibility to have uh, due regard to people being drawn into terrorism. And it seems to me that the community and the wider public may not necessarily be the best people to do that because we're not always trained to do that. We're not, we don't always have the expertise to do that. There are agencies of the state that do, though. And I think that, uh, you know, is, is it wise to try and shift that away entirely from those agencies i don't know mm. uh, one of the key criticisms concerned that have been expressed by universities in particular regarding the prevent duty is that it could affect free speech and debate of challenging ideas on campus as you state in your book concerns about students and their radical potential is nothing really new yet recent terrorist plots have famously involved individuals who may or may not have been radicalized on campus can you talk to us about sort of the history of student radicalism and the complexities around university cultures with regarding to implementing the prevent duty today? Well, as you say, universities have long been sites where people have engaged in what's been regarded as radical political activity. And particularly if you look at the 1960s and the 1970s, mm. the United States especially was one, one arena where students were engaging in radical activity, anti-Vietnam War protests. Yeah, and, Berkeley being very famous, wasn't it, for that? Of course, and recently we, 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 we've had the commemorations of the, the events at Kent State mm -hmm. uh, where, where students had been killed by members of the National Guard uh, and so on in the course of protests. So Universities have long been places which have been, you know, sites of radical contestation between the students and sometimes the state mm. or where the policies of the state have been contested. The United States is only one place, France of 1968, of course, where the student radical protests lead to a, a much more widespread public uh, a, a national level protests, which involve the, the president temporarily. Uh, leaving his place of residence and coming back. Uh, such was the, the tension in the air. And of course, in Germany as well, where you had the, 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 the SDS and the student radicals who were trying to make the, as they saw it, the repressive nature of the state apparent by coming into to confrontation with the, the, the forces of law and order. Mm. Closer to home, of course, you, you also had a student radicals who were very important in the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and groups such as the People's Democracy who were trying to, uh, if you like, expose what they saw as the uh, discrimination then uh, apparent in Northern Ireland. So as well as that, while students have been very active in protest and, 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 and universities have been places where people have become engaged in this sort of politics, so too have they been places where states have surveyed and, 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 and gone in and tried to ascertain what was going on. Uh, some student movements have been infiltrated by state agencies. Case of Canada we talk about in the book, um, where the, the RCMP uh, were concerned about, uh, firstly, communist activity and latterly, Quebecois uh, separatist activity. So universities are long places where uh, radical politics have, have been uh, enacted and where the state has got involved, mm. but not always without controversy. The difficulty with state involvement in universities is that universities, both in terms of the law in some places and in terms of their own self-image, would, would see themselves as places where free debate and free exchange of ideas can and should take place. Mm. Even some ideas which we may find offensive or even, you know, repugnant that those those are places where debates can and should take place in an environment where ideas can be aired and challenged so it is deeply problematic from that point of view to then say well should and how and to what extent should the state be involved in trying to regulate the exchange of ideas in these spaces mm. 
On the other hand, there are those who say, well, if we don't try and regulate those, then we're potentially leaving the stage open for radical groups to come in and potentially recruit people into violence. And if you look at the British university campus scene uh, in the 1990s, for example, you had groups such as Hizbut Tahrir, um, who were regarded as extremist uh, movements, and some of the people involved in that milieu uh, going on to uh, uh, become involved in other uh, extreme movements, uh, such as al Mahajarun and so on. So it's not that there there hasn't been an issue, but the question is, where do you draw the line? Mm. What can and should the state do? And, you know, what's permissible and what's not when it comes to, uh, you know, freedom of speech? Yeah, one one question is a bit off topic. It kind of gets into that kind of um, what people like to call cancel culture territory. Um, so feel free to ignore it if you wish to. Where Where's that fine line between repulsive ideas and free speech? It, because there's been some controversy, certainly I've seen in the last 10 years, where you've had Islamic extremists or people with sympathetic views of Islamic extremism or far-right extremism who have been given a platform on campus, whilst more moderate voices have been shut down. And, um, you know, some place that come to mind off the top of my head, uh, there's been some controversy at SOAS, there's been some controversy at um, University of East London, I believe. I could be wrong on that one. But anyway, but there's been certain controversies that have popped up. So where where is that fine line between sort of seeing someone express a view that we should be uh, understand, but at the same time not kind of condone it? Well, uh, 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 you make an interesting point, Chris, and, and funny enough, we've been doing some research on this very topic recently. We've, we've just finished a project on free speech in universities, um, which we hope to uh, publicize fairly soon. But you mentioned the different types of radical group, and I think to come back to what I was saying earlier, it's important to note that one of the most recently prescribed groups, National Action, mm-hmm. emerged from the campus scene, and that was very much a far-right neo-Nazi type organization so there, there are different mm. types of groups uh, out there who have kind of used the, the 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 campus scene to try and promote their ideas the fine line i think certainly from our research uh, the recent research tends to be when you ask people what the line is it's when people start advocating support for violence and that's where people generally see the line. Mm. Most people don't want to see people offended. Most people go out of their way not to offend people, and they try and maybe regulate their speech to ensure that they're pretty inclusive of their, mm. their peers, as probably most people in society do. But the absolute line for most people is the advocacy of violence. Mm. And I, I think you know there are some people who have spoken who I think are aware of that, and they definitely make sure they put a kind of what I would call reasonable spin on their on their points of view. But it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because um, it's very hard to sort of navigate that. But I, I think you know, obviously, advocating violence is definitely the the line, isn't it? Uh, is there anything yours to add to that, Catherine? Well, just to say, it's interesting in the light of the fact that there is a, a proposed new bill uh, about freedom of speech university and. The government, on the one hand, is sort of, sort of pushing this idea that, that universities are these arenas, the, the cliche of snowflake students, all that kind of thing. Mm. And then on the other hand, has through the prevent duty created a framework at which uh, the tension between what's extremism and violent extremism is hard to navigate. If you actually look at the amount of legislation around free speech for universities, in proposed addition to the new legislation and the prevent duty. There's long-standing commitments to protect freedom of speech. There's a whole host of malicious communications and other legislative issues. And also the Equality Act, which requires universities and all public institutions, not just to respect people's protected characteristics, but to foster good relations between them. Mm. So universities don't always get it right, I think it's worth saying. And that line, as you say, can be hard to draw. But I'm wondering if new legislation in the midst of a thicket of legislation that grows around universities is really the answer. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think with universities, one thing I appreciate is at least the institutions are thinking about these things, aren't they? And they seem to, it seems to be an environment where people do care about free speech. So that's one ray of hope, I suppose, in this complexity. Well, they're certainly thinking about it more than those who've been pushing the legislation. You saw uh, Michelle Donnellan, the uh, university's minister, completely stuff her communications on the first day by essentially going, yeah, Holocaust denial will be absolutely fine. And then having to backtrack like, no, 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 it's not. But Holocaust denial is, of course, 
not illegal in this country. Mm. I think a lot of it is about the question of what is a university for and the kind of people who are sort of pushing entirely on free speech, which I completely respect and support. I'd see myself as a free speech advocate, including of very offensive and unpleasant things to hear. Mm. They tend to sort of see it all in this kind of very bland marketplace of ideas. Uh, all these kind of uh, sort of issues will come out. But there's another perspective on the universities, which is universities are seats of reasoned learning and knowledge. And not every opinion is based on the rigor and quality that deserves to appear in a university setting. And by making it appear in a university setting, you are giving people credibility and you are giving credibility to ideas uh, that can be dismissed and picked apart in five minutes flat. Mm. So the government and other people have to get straight in their head. This massive, much bigger question that we're all struggling to answer in the 21st century is, what are universities for? Yeah, yeah. One thought just crossed into my mind again, sorry, with controversial speakers issue. Um, a lot of the time, the controversial speakers are usually invited by a particular student group. So I don't know whether the, it, I, honestly, it's been a long time since I've been to university. Is there, and I, and I must admit, I didn't, I wasn't booking any speakers. So is there like a, a centralization, if that's the right way, or standardization of, of how one books a speaker and a kind of process to determine whether they are a Holocaust denier or, I don't know, or, or want to stone gaze to death or something horrific like that? Is there some sort of process that they have to go through now when booking someone? The prevent duty, uh, it, one of the things it requires is the vetting of speakers. So uh, if you were to uh, come onto campus and address, talk about your podcast, we would put that through the process, even though we don't uh, think that you're liable to come on uh, and say something that would fall into that uh, category. So kind of everything goes through that mill. There is a complication, though, which is people sort of talk about universities, but universities are one thing. Student unions are another. Well, yeah. And they are not subject to the same legal conditions. And the students' unions ultimately answer to the Charity Commission and charitable frameworks and regulations. And this has become a, a, a tension within PREVENT, which I, the PREVENT duty applies directly to the university. But I think Sean would agree with me. It's a different picture for in terms of what it actually can reach in terms of the student union. And that's been a, a little bit of an anomaly. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one of the phrases we use in, in the book is, is the tick box approach. And that came out of the research that we've done. And for things like the uh, the vetting of external speakers, it's a, there's generally speaking a bit of a tick box approach. It's like, you know, a sort of a, a very light vetting form. Mm. Has Chris ever expressed any extremist views or blah, blah, blah? And, you know, it's, 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 it's a tick no. You know, I'm not saying there's a huge uh, invasion or a kind of constraint on freedom of speech. But you do have to take the box. Mm, mm. Do you tell us a bit more about that? Um, what's the word I want? Sort of division, I suppose, between student union. Because it, I find it really interesting because I've, obviously um, I have seen on campus protests against prevent from student groups. And there seems to be, and this, this might sound patronising, so I apologise to any people who's listening who thinks I'm about to say something that sounds really patronising. I sometimes think that younger people, and I used to be a young person once, believe it or not, not so much now, but um, that younger people don't always sort of get the complexity of the issue. And, and also, I suppose, the duty of law enforcement and the state to actually at least try and do something about extremism and extremist views on campus. And so I tend to notice a lot of student groups tend to kind of just take a very anti-government approach to things, saying, oh, the government involved, this is terrible. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that ramble there. but <laughs> Well, interestingly, the National Union of Students and our union, the uh, UCU, uh, have been allied in this student, not suspects campaign and have disliked particularly the idea that for Muslim students in particular, this sense that campus might be a place that you would be surveilled. Mm. So they've had that kind of uh, issue and, and been very focused on it. On the other hand, a lot of uh, the kind of sort of free speech debate has been about no platforming. And there are a range of issues that wouldn't fall into this um, extremist bracket that have been very controversial uh, about whether people are allowed to talk or not. But if you actually look at the NUS's official no platforming, it's groups who wouldn't be allowed to come speak on campus anyway because of the prevent duty. Uh, and they've had a long standing ban on the far right, but also a number of Islamist extremist groups are officially no platform by the NUS as a whole. So on the one hand, you might say, well, actually, there's not that much tension in, in the issues of speaking around prevent. 
But for the NUS, it's seeing themselves as advocates for students being on the kind of receiving end of this. Mm. Certainly that, that there are sort of bigger generational divides, I think, about uh, the idea that um, free speech is for one set of people a kind of cornerstone. And for other sets of people, they, they, they see it in this Trojan horse model, a, a way of um, reinforcing inequality and abuse. But when it comes to prevent, it um, is something that a lot of the speakers uh, wouldn't be welcome on campus anyway. So uh, that's a kind of bit of a sort of interesting, uh, again, a mismatch or an anomaly to what the, the perspective might be from outside. But certainly the blanket kind of pushback response from the NUS and from the union uh, has been a, a worry about all the kind of things that people worry about, surveillance, chilling effect, the kind of things that we have actually said that uh, aren't, aren't actually as intrusive as you think they are. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, I, I think it's a divisive issue regardless of age and generation, because, you know, if you look at a number of the uh, advocacy groups or charities, for example, that are civic, civil society organizations who are anti-prevent, you know, they're anti-prevent and, and, and stridently so every bit as much as some of the students. And, you know, I think the arguments that are made by people across the generations who are opposed to the policy in principle are quite similar, mm. actually. So I think in fairness to the, the, the younger generation, those arguments cut across. That's good. We'd also say that, um, although, as you can tell, we're, we're critical of many aspects of this, we'd also acknowledge that the way in which prevent is presented uh, it, through the media often sometimes exaggerates what's actually happening. So people will tell you in the middle of a class that, oh, you know, someone's been referred to a channel because uh, they were playing Fortnite. Uh, you know, somebody said uh, they lived in a terrorist house, not a terrorist house, and they've ended up, you know, going through the prevent duty. And when you get to the bottom of these stories, it's not actually what's uh, gone on. Um, so that, you know, you have to kind of acknowledge that in particular, some advocacy groups do have an axe to grind. But then on the other hand, the government doesn't help itself. Uh, recent choices of, uh, you know, chairs for a review of Prevent and things like that do reinforce the, the sense that they only have one's perspective of who's to blame and who's in the right. So they don't exactly cover themselves in roses all the time over this. Yeah. Yeah. I think people who work in Prevent some of the time, some of their concerns are that, uh, you know, this misrepresentation of the policy is, is, if you like, being carried out sometimes perhaps in bad faith by people who are intractably opposed to it anyway. Mm. They're not that, you know, or at least sometimes the claim is that they're not really interested in objective fact that they're, they're trying to, to spin this their particular way. So I think that's probably why those who are for prevent and maybe work in it are aggrieved by this sort of thing. Mm. I mean, to be fair to some prevent practitioners, there are certain groups like CAGE, for example, who have mounted many a campaign to kind of undermine the prevent strategy. And unfortunately, I've seen certain CAGE members being invited onto campus without any acknowledgement of the controversy around that group. Well, I'd agree with that. And, uh, you know, people will, will often be very hostile of, of another organisation called MEND. Mm. But, you know, MEND have also actually given training to police services. Uh, it's not just uh, student unions who have brought them in. So, but I mean, you had uh, William Balday on uh, your program and yeah. he was audibly gnashing his teeth about Cage having unseated the um, appointed reviewer for Prevent. But Cage would never have got within a million years of doing that if the whole appointment process and his first initial announcements, which were essentially Prevent's great, prove me wrong. Uh, it, it became so obvious that this was maybe not someone who was presenting themselves in a way uh, that was going to invest people's confidence in the process. Mm. So, yes, certainly there, there, there are kind of, uh, as Sean said, people who are looking to misrepresent, looking to manipulate, looking to exaggerate. And our constant theme of what we have found is the things that you think are the big problem are not actually the big problem. Mm. But by the same token... You have to think about why these things get traction. And it's not just people's naivety. Often mistakes have been made. Mm, and we have to learn from these mistakes. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, definitely. So for policymakers, active recruiting is part and parcel of the explanation for people, particularly young people, engaging in terrorist activity. Governments and policymakers, both within and beyond the UK, use a grooming model to understand, explain why people engage in political violence. So could you talk to us about this? Well, the grooming model 
we argue is, is essentially a way of looking at individuals which has vulnerability at its very heart. And so the individual is seen as potentially vulnerable to engagement in terrorism. And as the prevent duty and prevent has become more widespread, it's kind of almost as if all individuals are potentially vulnerable to become engaged firstly in extremist thought and then perhaps potentially in extremist action. Whereas in the past, if we look at other conflicts or or, or even the, the, the conflict in Northern Ireland, People weren't necessarily seen in those terms. There was a lot more emphasis on individual agency. As Catherine said earlier, these sort of means-based or structural factors, why people maybe got engaged in in conflict in the first instance, whereas now the emphasis is on individual vulnerability and the notion of this nefarious recruiter sat in a dark room with, uh, you know, all sorts of messaging platforms trying to say, you know, come and join us. It's great here. We we have the answers. We know how terrible things are in your life. And the person just going further and further down that rabbit hole. Mm. And and the entire policy is premised on this, this notion. I mean, vulnerability is at the heart of prevent and the prevent duty training, which which people get is all based around the, these potential factors, which might make people vulnerable to extremism or potentially being drawn into terrorism and we would see that as a shift in, in the ways in which these these things are thought about over time excellent Catherine, is there anything you want to add to that yeah just that it it often borrows from the language of child sex exploitation uh, and a whole framework has been set up to identify victims of sexual exploitation and the grooming model uh, very very much draws on that and it focuses very much on personal circumstances and weakness and vulnerability. If you watch the training packages, for example, they will uh, pinpoint a young man whose parents are divorcing and he's doing badly at school and he goes to football without a male authority figure. Nice uh, Tony, I believe is called in the prevent package, uh, uh, sidles up to him, want to be a man, want to hang out with us, want to have a few pints. And lo and behold, before he knows it, he's a Nazi. But when the school spots him, step in, and his uncle starts taking him to football, it all gets better again. So it doesn't really kind of engage in anything beyond that level of the individual. And it very much uh, focuses us on this idea that uh, certain people are, are very limited in their agency and are liable to fall for this kind of material. The prevent duty applies to a range of public bodies from statutory education to prisons to NHS, as well as higher education institutions. This marks a ramping up of involvement from the government, which, despite a change in party makeup, has never been happy with the level of engagement from universities. So can you sort of talk to us about this? Yeah, so universities have been uh, identified quite early on at what's called quote unquote radicalising locations. So because people are vulnerable to being radicalised, university is a uh, hotspot to be vulnerable because it's a young person who is away from home for the first time, possibly quite isolated and anxious. So it fits that that definition. Mm. There was also concerns that universities had been uh, slow off the mark to address the kind of uh, uh, matters you raised earlier, that particular unions and particular societies were through uh, the auspices of uh, promoting and discussing religious identity and, and Muslim experiences in the UK and allowing that as a pathway for people to engage, get involved in particularly extreme activities. So they were worried about specific threat of Islamism and Islamist groups, but more generally, it was this sense of the radicalising location, the young person atomised away from their usual uh, settings and sort of ripe and vulnerable for those kind of grooming tentacles uh, to get to them. Mm. And universities have actually kind of adapted to this and that's been the way in which they've dealt with the prevent duty. They've complied with all the kind of basics. So you want a vetting policy on speakers. Here's a vetting policy on speakers. You want us to have uh, filtering systems for our IT. Here's filtering systems for our IT. But safeguarding and vulnerability has for the universities been the way around the more controversial stuff, the potential threats to freedom of speech, the idea that particular groups might be surveilled. If you say this is just a health and well-being issue, 
And this is what universities have done. They've integrated it into their safeguarding policies, Mm. safeguarding policies that were originally designed for students who were going out to work in health professional capacities. If you do that, you create everybody as potentially vulnerable. It therefore cannot be accused of racism or, or any other form of discrimination. There's a nice set of policies already up there. There's already health and well-being people there. And so universities who really, really resisted the prevent duty, vice chancellors were very united. There were campaigns. They advocated and lobbied politicians who spoke on their behalf. Once it came in, they dealt with it by let's deal with this as at the bare minimum level. Let's comply. Let's comply. Let's comply. If there's something they're not required to do, unlike schools, they're not required to promote British uh, fundamental British values. So they don't. We won't bother, Mm. but we will subsume everything into safeguarding. And from our perspective, that is the actual problem. Mm. And it's a problem for universities generally, the the, the continued infantilization of the student body, the idea of the university as a kind of consumerist, passively uh, absorbed experience. And now everybody is a vulnerable soul who must be protected by the university. That's what, how governance has dealt with it. And, w- and we can see why it's logical and practical, mm. but for us, it's the real problem. Okay. And Sean, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I think, I think the, the question of the continued marketization of higher education is an important one because the student as consumer, the university is therefore responsible for what's called the student outcomes. And, and, and these are sometimes put into metric tables and so on. So the universities have to demonstrate that they've got good student outcomes, which used to include things like a good career, but now includes, you know, keeping them from becoming terrorists and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's just uh so why it made me laugh, but uh Well, because it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. No, it is it is difficult. Um you mentioned earlier about so we talk a bit about the idea of surveillance on particular groups and how that kind of falls into sort of racism and stuff. And I remember many years ago, I had a a chat with uh, a former special branch person and police officer, and I have this whole hobby. If I find out, if I meet anybody socially who happens to be in the police or special branch or anything like that, I'm always always sort of grilling them a bit uh, because I just want to know what I can. What circles are you uh, running in that you're always running into special branch? Oh, not that many. <laughs> I, I, I have a, well, God, yeah. No, I have something called a spy doll where I, I can go anywhere and within about half an hour I will f- accidentally meet somebody who has some vague connection to the intelligence <laughs> services. So I'm, I'm a magnet for this sort of stuff, which leads to very interesting conversations. Um, So he, one of the, I remember he, uh, this guy I spoke to, we, he talked about how like focus literally shifts from one group to another depending on the perceived threat so he said like with regards to islamic extremism the reason it's the focus is because of sort of 9-11 this was actually pre-isis this conversation so it was 9-11 and al-qaeda and he said obviously before it was northern ireland because of the ira so threats change um you know for all we know 10 years time there might be some I don't know, group from Italy or something that, uh, <laughs> I don't know, the, and suddenly Italians become suspect or something. So how, do, how does one deal with a threat that unfortunately does sort of fall into a particular ideology that can be perceived as racist, but it's still a genuine threat that needs to be looked at? How do we deal with that? Well, I think first off, I'd say is it is a genuine threat. Mm. And sometimes the way people talk about when they get into the critique of prevent you would think that there was no threat at all. You do sometimes have to say, you know, things have happened. These attacks are real. But some sort of response within debate, uh, particularly about the debate about of the uh, prevent duty, uh, Greer and Bell are probably the people who've kind of been most focused on this. They'll sort of say, yes, prevent was had a very strong headcount focus uh, and prevent priority areas, despite being prevent, uh, presented in different terms, are largely uh, census-based. That hasn't really been quite helpful in identifying the fact that that many people have been converts to the cause. Mm. So when you're sort of talking about it in ideology and ideological terms, that's not quite the same time as talking about it in religious terms. But at least when something is a clear ideology, you can begin to see the logic and substance of that. Where Prevent, I think, is struggling now is that they are straying into areas that don't actually neatly fit. The ideological boxes anymore. That are oh, this Islamism. This is the far right. The words we heard in talking with uh, people in law enforcement recently and reading about the topic more widely is pick and mix. Uh, people who are uh, potential threats of violence who uh, may be swinging from an Al Qaeda training manual uh, to the deepest, darkest QAnon uh, uh, sort of chat. 
within the space of five minutes. The question about incel, incel violence, and are incels terrorists? And if so, what is their ideology? And how does that fit into a wider sort of issue of misogyny? So yes, you can say, well, when there is a particular group, you will have to look at that particular group. And there is sub substance to that, uh, albeit possibly not in the massively ham-fisted way that has occurred a lot of the time here. Mm. But now Prevent is straying again down the path because of vulnerability and well-being into that sort of long sort of debated issue about, particularly when we look at lone wolves, where are we talking about terrorism? Where are we talking about mental health? Is this ideological at all? So those tools are not going to be fit for those pathways and yet that is what they are possibly moving towards. I would add to that that the way you address uh, ideas is through ideas. And you can't, I think, strip out the politics of what's going on here. Politics is central to most of these things. But if we reduce everything to individual vulnerability, I think the politics could potentially get left out and you have a blind spot. That is, to my mind, where the risk lies. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. You conducted a series of interviews of volunteer focus groups looking at the concerns of implementing the prevent duty at universities. And you mentioned in your book that there are anxieties and concerns about the, both the utility and the theory underpinning the duty and its implementation. Because we have some mouthful, isn't it? As well as concerns that the existence of a prevent duty could have a chilling effect on academic debate. Despite their concerns before the passing of the CTSA, universities have largely abided by their lawful duty. So can you talk to us about sort of your research methods and sort of findings in this area? Well, the student and staff that we spoke to, uh, we conducted a, a range of focus groups with. Uh, so we spoke to two groups of students, one group which had studied terrorism and conflict related topics and one which had not to try and sort of control for any differences there and in, in, in knowledge and whether or not those who had studied the, the topic had, had maybe a bit more insight on it or different opinions. And likewise with staff, we, we interviewed a group of staff who had taught these, these topics and those who had not. We picked up on a number of different uh, themes within the book. So we analyzed the focus group data using interpretative phenomenological analysis. And I'm impressed with myself that I was able to say that properly. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it, it doesn't always work, I'll be honest with you. But yeah, we, <laughs> this time was good. And, uh, you know, analyzed the transcripts and picked out a number of themes from those. One of the things that we kept uh, coming back to with specific reference to your question on the chilling effect mm. is that if there is self-censorship in universities, it's not necessarily because people are afraid of, you know, the, the state coming in and the, the door being knocked down for something they might have said in a seminar with three other people at nine o'clock on whatever morning. Mm. Uh, if they do watch what they say, it's because they don't want to offend their peers and people are very conscious of wanting to be inclusive they want to have debates and discussion they even want to discuss controversial things they genuinely don't want to offend their neighbor so the chilling effect that many people had feared at least for us um wasn't something that was coming out and likewise with staff mo most staff that we spoke to i mean none of them seemed to have modified their research topics or the topics they discussed the one topic that kept coming up as the one that people were a bit reticent about is around Palestine. Mm. That's the one topic that people kept saying, that's the one we're a bit concerned about because it's the most emotive. But other things like radicalization, terrorism, violence in general, not so much of a concern. Mm. Is there anything else out there, Catherine? Um, just to say that um, people had absorbed this idea of the, the, the groomed stereotype, or uh, students in particular. Uh, they spoke about people like Jihadi John as basically like he was a bit of a, a sad, drifting, loner type, wasn't he? So they've taken on this stereotype of what does a radicalised person look like? And we're sort of saying if if the evidence base isn't there for that, if that isn't actually the person who, who you can spot, who is the kind of violent threat, could you actually be sort of lulling people into a sort of false sense of security? Uh, so they're like, what well, you know, that is what the threat looks like. That is what a radicalized person looks like. But me, me, I'm a I'm an active citizen, I'm a an inquiring student. I'm completely different to that. And all my friends are completely different to that. So certainly these kind of ideas that are sw swirling around the policy people have absorbed 
But one issue and one continuous sort of critique of this whole sort of area is, do we have a robust evidence base? Do we have control groups? Do we have the kind of thing that makes us say, well, what if we did something different or, or how can we actually measure the impact upon this? And so certainly people are absorbing that uh, it is the kind of sort of lost and lonely soul. And you can see that in the way that people talk about Shamima Begum. Mm, I was going to mention her. Yeah. Yeah. Female jihadis in particular always comes up. Yeah. And people sort of oddly uh, stripping her entirely of agency and sort of saying, you know, you don't have to be a frothing telegraph reader who uh, wishes for um, your know, capital punishment to come back for this particular individual to sort of see that this is somebody who made their own choices. And yet we fall into this idea of sort of saying, oh, you know, completely without agency, completely vulnerable, completely groomed. And it's one thing we've sort of said in the book generally towards the end, which won't sort of get onto the conclusion, sir, because we'll, we'll deal with those later. But sort of if there are later violent attacks and universities have treated this all as a matter of health and well-being, do you think people are going to be impressed by that? Do you think people will be delighted to learn that there was concerns about this person and so we we treated them with kid gloves and treated them as, as, as though they had no responsibility for this? But certainly the stereotype is out there and people are seeing that in their mind on campus as that's what the threat is. Just on the point uh, regarding the evidence base, I think it's important to note that the factors relating to vulnerability and the notion of these vulnerabilities comes from a quite limited sample uh, from research that was originally carried out within the prisons and corrections system. And as I say, the, the, the sample there was limited to particular types of extremists, Islamist extremists, and some of that, the, the, the potential sample had, uh, you know, different backgrounds and, and didn't necessarily display those factors. So much more research, I think, is needed before we can categorically say that this vulnerability approach is the approach to take. Mm. What we were saying about the whole grooming model um, and vulnerability, it kind of provides uh, quite a compelling narrative and it makes a very complicated situation seem quite simple and solvable. So I can understand why it's popular, um, definitely. And I think like with what we were saying about female jihadis as well, um, it does rob people of agency and I, um, and it, it sort of makes that person the underdog. And there is a big problem when discussing um, women who join terrorist organisations. And that's a, a whole topic for a whole other podcast. And we've certainly done an earlier one on it. So I won't delve into that too much. But it's, um, yeah, we are, we are always looking for sort of simple answers to complex situations, aren't we? It seems to be a real problem. And media, typically media reporting, is very narrative based and, and likes to provide ideas that, oh, today we've got the definitive answer, you know, exclusive in the Telegraph or the Sun or, or the Guardian. We have it. We've cracked it. <laughs> and it does distort actual conversations about this, doesn't it? And, and it's not to say that, you know, that nobody who engages in, in this sort of activity has vulnerabilities or, 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 or is vulnerable, but it's the extent to which then that we can extrapolate from the fact that there may be some people who are vulnerable mm. and have certain defined vulnerabilities that that applies to everybody. Yeah, yeah. It also overstates what uh, counterterrorism is about and what it needs to do. And I think undermines the legitimacy of uh, people who are engaged in counterterrorism. You do have to surveil people. You will have to look at online engagements and look for particular language and debates and try and identify patterns of people who are going to interact and um, you know move towards planning. You have to do that within a, a liberal democratic framework. But it's it's more possibly that the, the simplistic presentation, the narratives, which then have their equal set of a quite simple counter cases and counter arguments that then maybe obscure that there are real threats and mm. we do have to have conversations about them and we do have to have strategies to deal with them. If we actually climb down from the idea that we have these big kind of overarching uh, sort of goals within prevent uh, and just said, you know, we're doing these things, we think they work, we're collecting and assessing the evidence as we went. Might not be so glamorous, but it would be a, a fair assessment. Mm -hmm. We're moving into conclusions and recommendations here. So, uh, you know, as we're saying, we're always looking for these sort of simple answers and stuff. And there, and there probably there isn't a simple answer. There's no singular answer to terrorism or counterterrorism or terrorism recruitment. So, can you talk to us about sort of your final conclusions and your recommendations based on sort of your research into counterterrorism and its effectiveness? 
Well, we, we, we have a number and a number of the key ones are that um, universities need to make much more of the monitor and reporting chains that they have and they need to critically evaluate and engage with that data to um, try and really get a sense of what's going on with the policy and ways to improve it. We would argue as well that uh, institutions should collaborate internationally um, on, on these issues and share best practice because universities, ultimately, their their bread and butter is research and the generation of knowledge. So mm-hmm. they should be at the forefront of trying to better understand policy and practice in this area. But essentially, one of the things that we, we do say is that policymakers need to disaggregate counter extremism from counter terrorism mm. um, because that's 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 problematic you know the extreme views are you know they do need to be challenged equally people who are security threats to the country need to be stopped from doing that but joining these two together may not necessarily be the best way to do that because it kind of blurs the line between on the one hand countering extremist ideas and countering a very discernible and real security threat and that makes the ends a bit more unclear and blurred and for us that's a policy potentially a policy pitfall that could have negative implications for our security yeah is there anything you'd like to add Catherine? yeah just to say i think that um to stress that we do recognize uh the threat the importance of it the need for strategies but this whole edifices that get built one of which is about the idea that you know we can identify these particular pathways. The overconfidence there is maybe unhelpful. And the idea of maybe straying into um, fixing people when the problems are huge and social. In particular, you know, we're sat here in a week in which uh, the conflict in uh, Israel and Palestine is taking on a dimension here that I don't think it has before. And there are big uh, kind of swirling sort of issues around that. And yes, out of that, some people may end up being quote unquote radicalized and engaging in violent activity. But we need to separate out and be realistic about what it is that we can do, both in terms of being within a liberal democratic framework and um, not spoiling and tainting the need that we all have for effective counterterrorism, mm-hmm. and I think specifically within universities, we need to be realistic about what it is that both institutions and staff can do. Um, I think some of these ideas that the member of, of university staff could spot, you know, changes in behaviour in, in, in their cohort. Well, certainly in the last year, that would be very difficult to do uh, <laughs> in the current climate. Uh, but equally, I think it's premised on the notion of you know small classes where lecturers and students are, are very much well known to one another. Some institutions that pertains, some institutions it doesn't. Mm. So as the, the, the university and the structures of the, the modern university, let's say, um, ideally placed to play a role in both diagnosing potential problems and countering them, personally, I'm not so sure that it's ideal for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, my memories of the university, my classes were quite big. I don't remember having a, a dedicated person to check in with, except for sort of different topics you do. Yeah, it was very different to sixth form where it felt a bit more like a community. You do very much feel more alone at university. At least I did when I was at university. So I don't know if that's changed, if that's got better or worse. I'm not sure. I think it, it, it depends on the institution and it depends on the extent to which individuals feel comfortable and moving in new social circles and getting involved in, mm. in small groups and, and, and activities. Some people are very comfortable with that and some people you know, find that a challenge. Mm. How has your book and research sort of been received? Has, has, it, has there been any interest from sort of official bodies or, or anything like that? We have ended up having uh, conversations uh, with people working in law enforcement, particularly people working in counterterrorism police, and that's been really interesting for us. It's an academic book at the end of the day. It's, a, you know, it's, it's not a knocking off uh, the bestsellers in Waterstones. <laughs> but we had some good feedback as well when we presented about kind of things that we would have liked to have done differently that we had to be honest about. As I said to you, this started out as a project about how do people deal with teaching controversies and terrorism and ended up kind of going a slightly different way. If we'd run it all again from the beginning, we would have felt it would have been much more uh, richer 
if we had actually engaged with people who are responsible for well-being and so forth to actually get their views and ideas. Mm. And that's something um, that, that we would have liked to have gone forward. Um, but yes, it, as an academic book, uh, it's uh, um, kind of limited in its audience, but it has been interesting discussing it, particularly with people who work for relevant agencies to kind of get their views and, and feedback. And we hope to do the same as we now move forward more generally into this project that we're doing about the the impact of these uh, very contentious debates about free speech at university. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, just as it's a difficult topic for academics to research, it's it's certainly a hugely difficult issue for practitioners and various agencies to navigate as well. So we're all on the same page when it comes to uh, recognising that this is not a simple topic to deal with. Mm, mm. We like to think that we come across as critical friends uh, rather than uh, people with access to grind. We do think there are problems. We do think there are issues. But we don't think that's the same as uh, simply looking uh, to undermine and naysay. Mm. What I would say as well, I mean, I've been doing this podcast for five years now and stuff, it obviously prevents come up a few times. And it's good to see people who acknowledge that there is a realistic threat, um, you know, from terrorism, because there are some commentators out there who like to think it's all just exaggerated. And, they almost, and there are even some who, who go down a slightly more conspiratorial route and start to sort of throw out Orwell and what have you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so it's, it's good to see that you do acknowledge um, that there is a threat from sort of terrorism and it is real. Well, well, it would like, be interesting. Sorry, you go. Yeah, you, you, you go first. You. <laughs> it, it would be interesting to revisit conversations with some of those people mm. as the far right uh, becomes more visible. Uh, and a lot of the things that people have felt comfortable about being critical about prevent, if they continue to hold them true when the kind of poster boy for these uh, kind of uh, acts is somebody more associated from the far right or moving into these kind of sort of incel groups, then that's great. That's their genuine commitment. If there are uh, ideas around the, uh, their sense that, you know, there are only certain be- be people being picked on and this this is an agenda. But then when other people come into their spotlight, like, no, it's fine to go after them, you know, follow them about, so they, you know, do whatever you have to do. Then maybe they have to think about, is it about your politics or is it about the strategy? Mm. It doesn't mean that you can't be critical and come from a particular partisan perspective, but you've always got to be in rigorous debate with yourself, if you like, about you know, wh- why do I make these assumptions yeah. about particular policies when I when I go in to look at them? Mm. Yeah, I, I was just going to come back on the, on on the point of of the threat. Yes, there is a threat, but like every other threat, it is pitched at a certain level. Is terrorism an existential threat to us? I don't believe it is. Mm. But is it a security threat? And have you know? Do we need to counter it? Yes, absolutely, we do. We we make decisions about risk every day of our lives. And, uh, you know, we manage risk every day of our lives. People in the public health sphere who are trying to manage risk as we speak in the middle of the pandemic, we have to keep everything in perspective and devise appropriate strategies to deal with the risk. Hmm. I mean, there's one unfortunate thing that certainly comes up. And it is, I see, I saw it in passing in your book. I saw it in passing in Tom Parker's book and other books around terrorism. That unfortunately, terrorism is something you know, that we're always going to have to live with in some way or another, um, as terrible as that is, you know, and some people do view it as an existential threat and some people say it isn't. And I, and I think it really just depends on the country it's happening in, because I think in certain, um, maybe African and Middle Eastern countries currently, it might be more of an existential threat than it is in, in the UK. Um, so yeah, so we've got to be proportionate, haven't we? <laughs> I think that's a fair point. I would I would take that point that you've just made as as a counter to the thing. Yeah, very much depends geographically on the state that you're in and the strength of the state and the resilience of that state. Mm. And I think on the question of terrorism and its its potential to stay with us, there are scholars such as Richard English who have written on this topic and who talk about you know idea of of resilience and terrorism isn't necessarily going to go away, but we have to devise credible appropriate strategies to deal with it and to recognize that yes it may be a problem that's with it but with the right approach we can navigate the the challenge that it poses yeah yeah definitely examples from the 80s spain dealing with eta for example Mm. uh, when spain strayed into very 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 dodgy areas of death squads and uh, holding people in communicado and all those people coming out Funnily enough, you know, that wasn't something that it deterred ETA. 
taking what people like sort of uh, Paul Wilkins would refer to as like a kind of hardline approach, you know, within democratic frameworks, you know, they managed to get on top of ETA. And you know, with better intelligence, you saw fewer arrests, uh, but you saw better arrests, including in the end, the entire leadership got rounded up on, on the edge of France. So it's not a question of saying that you can't uh, do anything, that we must just uh, uh, have to sort of put up with this. It's not a question of saying the threat isn't real. It's about saying that you know one of the reasons why it's not an existential threat to us is because of our democratic credentials is because of social capital, is because of uh, the bonds that exist, uh, you know, socially. And so we mustn't take those for granted. Yeah, definitely. Is there, I think we've done a really good job here, but is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up? Any kind of final thoughts? Or if I could give you, you know, a position of authority, is there something you would do that would <laughs> that would change things for the better? <laughs> a final, if I could grant you one wish. <laughs> I don't think anybody would, would, would allow me a position of authority. And if they did, I, I, would, I would say that they should rescind that offer immediately. <laughs> no, absolutely. You really, you really don't want us to be in charge of, of too much. It would it would be a very bad day. It would be pretty much a, you let Dougal do a funeral kind of thing and it would, be, it would, it would not work out. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Catherine Jordan, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can listeners find out more about you and your work? So if you want to read the book, it's called Radicalisation and Counter-Radicalisation in Higher Education, and it's published by Emerald Press. Thank you very much, Chris. Really enjoyed the, uh, the, the, the show today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. This is Secrets and Spies. 